Okay, so today we're going to deal with this topic which is called the Great Dying, which is the Permian-Triassic extinction event. So the last class we dealt with the Permian period, which is a relatively robust period for terrestrial vertebrates. Our, the members of our own lineage did very, very well and were the dominant uh, terrestrial animal. And at this point, there's going to be a huge mass extinction event not related to them. It's not like they organized, uh, created a mass extinction event. But there's going to be a huge mass extinction event, which is going to reset the surface of the Earth and also, to some degree, the ocean uh, quite considerably. We're not going to deal with the ocean component of it too much. I'm going to talk about it today because of how extreme it is and how interesting it is as a result. But we're not terribly concerned with ocean environments because dinosaurs really spend almost no time, as far as we can tell, in the ocean. There are very few dinosaurs that come from oceanic environments in the sense that they're even associated with marine sediments and they're very limited in nature. So the ones that we have are things like Baryonyx and Spinosaurus appear to be near shore environments. And as far as we can tell, there are no uh, offshore dinosaurs that live fully aquatic lives. That's taken over by other groups of marine, uh, or other groups of reptiles, including uh, some that, the, 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 the turtles, right? Turtles make it out to the, the marine world and do very well and have persisted um, to present day. But there are also other groups that, that uh, that persist in the marine environment for long periods of time but eventually do go extinct. But dinosaurs, as far as we're concerned, do not. So the, the great dying, so this is the, the title of this extinction event, reflects the magnitude of this extinction event. And so by the time we get to the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, you're going to be surprised at how limited it is compared to this one. That's a bad extinction event. It's one of the worst. It doesn't compare to the level of this in some ways. So the Permian period, you saw this map before. This is the map of the Permian just before uh, the end of the Permian period, beginning of the Triassic. Keep in mind that the Permian period is warming throughout it. And then right at the Permian-Triassic extinction event, we're going to have a huge amount of warming involved. And the Earth temperature is probably, we're talking now in global climate change, we're, we're saying 2 to 3 centigrade is acceptable as an average temperature increase. That's probably as much as we're willing to tolerate. Permian estimates place it anywhere from about 6 to 10 centigrade average increase. So by the time you get to 10 centigrade increases, uh, if you're in a tropical zone, it's, it's a desert. It just doesn't matter. There's no way you can deposit enough water on the surface of the Earth for it not to evaporate immediately. If you're anywhere in the Arctic, there's no ice. There just can't be. It's just way too warm all season for that to occur. You might get intermittent snowfall, but that's it. Um, and if you're anywhere in between, there's going to be a narrow band of temperate regions. So we're going to see huge differences in temperature. And part of the problem you can see here for us to begin with is that a lot of this land is actually associated near the tropics. So that's going to become a serious issue um, for a lot of organisms especially terrestrial organisms, because all of that is going to become sort of absolute desert in the sense that it will be dry as dry can be. There will basically be no rainfall to speak of that organisms could take advantage of. So these are surface temperatures in the Permian right at the extinction event. Uh, the, this is one model, so this is not all models. But what you can see is the temperatures in these regions, here and here, right, these, these pinkish areas, those are temperatures that are averaging, averaging somewhere in the 38 to 48 centigrade range. So that would mean the average temperature is hovering around 120 Fahrenheit. That's the average temperature. Half of those temperatures will be above that on any given day, right? So 120 is your average daily temperature, right? That's brutally hot, uh, and you're going above that regularly. That also means, keep in mind it's a desert, so that means nighttime temperatures are probably going to dip way, 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 way down. There's going to be almost no control of temperature. So during the day, you're going to have to, you're basically not going to be able to be on the surface of the earth in that location. So you're going to have to be a burrower. And during the night, it'll be really cold. So it's going to be really hard for uh, ectothermic organisms to do really well in that environment. You're going to be switching between those extremes. So that, that's just to give you some example. And you can see up at the poles, right, the temperatures that we think of as cold, you're really dealing with 4 to 8 centigrade as an average temperature. That's relatively warm. You don't have permafrost uh, at the surface. You'd probably have to go fairly deep. And you don't have glaciers. You don't have ice caps. Maybe all the way down here at the south, maybe. So this is the end of the Permian. The Permian period ends in uh, much the same way that it 
uh, as a modern Earth looks today, in the sense that there's very complex trophic interactions, there's a lot of diversity on the surface of the Earth, um, there are uh, higher level, uh, large and small bodied predators and prey items, there are lots of different plants, there are forests, there are open lands, there are closed areas, there is a diversity of habitats, the nearshore environment is very productive, um, offshore environment is probably less productive but still relatively diverse, the bottom of the ocean is probably relatively diverse, uh, and all that's going to cease. And both of these animals, of course, that you see here belong to our, our group, the synapsids, and these guys are going to suffer terribly. Any organism that is, that is large and specialized in any way is just by default gone, um, almost to a T. Uh, organisms that are large are going to suffer very, very badly, and any organism that's a specialist will get wiped out. And so this is, in, in the evolutionary time sense, it's actually very interesting. Mass extinction events probably prevent specialists from dominating environments, right, because it constantly resets it for generalists. It constantly reselects for large numbers of generalists. And right here is the, the boundary layer. So you've, you've heard of the, the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. Here is the Permian Triassic boundary, right where this hammer is laying. And right away, it's very obvious something big happened here. You went from really dark rocks to really, really, really red rocks. And Triassic rocks are often associated with what are called red rocks or red horizons. And their name, the tri, means actually three colors. And it refers partially to these red colors, in fact. So these red colors are very characteristic of Triassic rocks. And what do you think the red colors would represent? What do you think is occurring that makes those rocks so red? What drives those colors? Volcanoes. It's oxidation, and it's, it is going to be partially volcanoes. We're going to talk about that. Iron. Iron and that oxidation. And the reasoning is that this is going to be because these environments are extremely arid. So we've gone from this, which is probably a relatively lush environment, with very, very slow sedimentation, probably a forest environment. And you can see, geologically speaking, it occurs instantly, and we go into an environment that's a desert. So you were standing in a forest, and you came back, and it's literally a flat desert, and there's nothing there. So that is going to warn you that there's some big stuff going on uh, between. If you look at marine sediment layers, what you find is you find these very nice flat lines. Right? That's great, actually. That, that means we have very, very detailed sedimentary la layers. But the reason that you get sedimentary layers like this is because there are no burrowing organisms, none. You cannot have a single worm pass through this and, and disrupt that. So there are no worms in this entire layer of growth. So how do Sicilians survive? <laughs> when we talk about extinct mass extinction events, you wipe out almost everything. You're talking about 99.9% .9 of individuals going extinct or more, right? <laughs> But you only need two to make it through in a lot of cases, right? So, and maybe one if you're hermaphrodite. So you don't need many to make it through. But most groups will go extinct here. So these, these rock layers right here, and again, you can start to see this oxidation coming in, warn you right away, there's not much left. You're going to obliterate everything that you can see. Does that mean there's a lot of fossils in those since it's nice um, lamination? No, because there's nothing living above them. So the, an so the answer is no, absolutely not. And not because they aren't deposited very cleanly, because there's just nothing in the water column above them to fall into them when they are being deposited. It was just sediment raining out from this, the, the shoreline. So if you look, this is a late Permian ocean floor, very, very diverse. We've got things that look like rays, right? These are actually primitive rays. We've got aminoids. We've got a variety of things like, like corals and... Um, uh, sponges, we've got brachiopods, we have sea urchins, you know, echinoderms, we have all sorts of burrowing organisms, lots of animals functioning at different depths within that sediment, right, so that's why you're not going to get those laminar, uh, those laminar deposits. And then literally, if you go just above that in the record, this is what you find, uh, two to three species of mollusk and nothing else. You can't, it is just nothing else in that ocean. So, right here, right, this is what we want to understand why. All of this is gone, largely extinct and wiped out. And what you make through is basically a couple of generalists that are relatively decent at filter feeding um, and that seem to be able to tolerate a variety of different conditions. If you look at the terrestrial environment, what we go from is uh, rivers that form these very nice S-shaped curves to rivers that look like this, which are these braiding rivers. And there's a very characteristic reason why. Why do we, why do we go from S-shaped curves to braided rivers? What drives that? 
erosion of sediment drives the meandering of the river, so it means that the sediment is eroding really, really quickly. Right. So what is happening is, in this case, erosion is limited because there's so much plant life around the edge that it, it pushes the stream in these different curves and it can't erode very quickly, so it channelizes it. Here what's happening is there is so little plant life left that the stream spreads out immediately and it erodes everything evenly. Everything is being eroded and it forms huge channels that wash out. In fact, we have deposits that look like all of the surface soil is washed away. So there's literally nothing organic left on top of it. It's all bedrock. So we are going to see um, changes in not just the, the oceanic environment, but you're going to lose every plant that you've ever seen around a forest. And that means, of course, if we wipe out all of the forests, there is not going to be much left in those waters, right? This is going to be urban runoff to an extreme level where you're going to rain somewhere and then almost immediately all that water is going to appear downstream. It's just going to be huge pulse events like you would have in a desert, right? This is exactly the kind of things you're going to experience. And that's going to cause huge amounts of erosion. That means if you're downstream, you're going to get buried all the time. And you're not going to have stable river channels. And it's going to make it really hard for any surviving plants to repopulate those areas. What other things can we learn um, from the extinction event? Well, here's another look at, at the extinction event. Again, here's some really nice dark rocks and then these reddish rocks up here. You, they're not always bright, bright red. But again, the, in general, they tend to be reddish color. Uh, what you can see here is these are very, very organic rich, coal, coal laden kind of rocks. Here's the extinction event. There's white rock right there, which tells you something different happened right at that forest. And then there's nothing above it, right? And this is actually largely true. Um, as far as we know, there's no coal deposited within six million years of the Permian Triassic boundary. It's gone. So that means that you have no forest remaining on the surface of the earth. You have no carbon sequestration into these forests, which means that forests don't exist. They're gone. So we're losing a lot of these, these large forests on the surface of the earth. So if you were to stand on a terrestrial surface of the earth just after the Permian Triassic extinction, what you would largely see is, is what would look something like the surface of the moon, in that it would just be bedrock, it would be exposed, there would be large boulders, probably not much in the way of sediment, certainly not much in the way of plant life. If anything, there might be some green stuff on top of things, um, and you might see some insect life some places. Um, does the oxygen in the atmosphere decrease due to this? Because folks like the CSN and Yes, yeah, so we're going to talk about this. So oxygen, of course, when you, when you oxidize rocks, that means that a lot of the oxygen is being picked out of the air uh, uh, to, be, to, to oxidize with the iron, which is primarily what's going on. But on top of that, there are, no, there are basically very few plants going on, so the rate of oxygen production also declines drastically. Um, I'm sorry, what was the uh, period of time after the Permian that we see no coal deposited? The Triassic. So right here in the early Triassic, you're not going to find coal. So if you're, if you're a no. geologist looking for coal for, uh, for production purposes, you wouldn't bother once you get to the Permian-Triassic boundary. You just skip forward to another location. So one of the things we want to know is, okay, what actually is caught? So obviously there's very large changes, and this is actually one of the strongest arguments for uh, against what was called gradualism, which is that everything happens gradually in geology and you have no sudden breaks in it. This is one of the very strong arguments against that because these things seem to appear very strongly uh, immediately after each other. Okay, so what, what's actually causing this, of course, is something we're interested in. Um, and the way we're going to do that is we're going to look at the rocks just before the boundary event, right? And we're going to have to look at the rocks just after the boundary event. And the better, the best we can do is to get them really close together, right? Preferably, we'd have them uh, deposited right in a row. But of course, it's really hard to find continuously depositive rocks. Why, why might that be the case? Why, what might partially drive that? Erosion. Erosion is going to drive part of that, yeah. And then the, the reason that we're going to have erosion is because we don't have communities above them. And then, of course, another issue is if you're depositing things in a community and you don't have that community anymore, what's going to be deposited, right? You're going to switch to an erosional environment. That's correct. Good. So this is, this is a characteristic of the Permian-Triassic extinction event, which occurs right here. It's a, the, the paper says 251. I think it depends on who you talk to. It might be 250.5 now. It's very close to that. For all intents and purposes, I just say 250 because it, we're, I'm just rounding to that, that about that location. Since I'm not working at that layer directly, since I'm not a geologist working at that layer, 250 is more than sufficient for us to work at. So let's say at 250 million years ago, um, you can see, first of all, that there are lots of these very steep dips 
and these graphs, which should alert you that some stuff is going on. There's a couple of things that happen. One is that seawater coverage changes just before the extinction event or just at it. There's also this big event we're gonna talk about, which are called the Siberian traps, which occur just throughout that extinction event. The carbon cycle seems drastically different from what it was prior, right? You have these huge up and down peaks. These are not dissimilar from the way that we're driving the carbon cycle right now. We're gonna talk about what that means. This is a measure of the magnesium, the calcium concentration in the ocean. When it falls below this line, it means that as far as we can tell, the ocean has become anoxic, which means there's no oxygen left in it. So if you're an organism that needs oxygen, that's really bad. And you can also see how long it persists in that, right? And it seems to go up and down, up and down, up and down. So it's, it's, it's coming back up sometimes, and then it it's immediately flips back down. So this is, a, this is a bad situation for organisms. So we're going to see what that does. There's lots of methane released at this point. And then it's, this, is, this is estimates from fossils. This, <laughs> this is the biodiversity right at it, right? So if you zoom in, you can see that there's just a little bit of white between this and this purple line, but otherwise everything else is gone. So biodiversity speaking, we get hammered, hammered at this line um, as far as the fossil record tells us. So let's talk about, let's start over here on the left and let's talk about the Siberian traps. Siberian traps are this enormous, 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 enormous um, outwash of lava and um, uh, other volcanic rocks in the area of Siberia, which makes sense because traps refer to volcanic rocks, rocks and Siberia is a horrible place that humans do occasionally live in. No, but actually that's not true. People do. And there's actually some people that do live here. Just kidding, Russia. So anyway, so <laughs> this is, these are the Siberian traps. So the Siberian traps are extremely, extremely large, right? And this is just the surface. So when you're looking down on it, they cover a huge amount of territory. Um, and that means that there's a lot, a lot of volcanic movement, or a lot of volcanic eruptions going on. And part of the reason for that is because the continents are moving around a lot. And as they do that, a lot of plates are being subducted or being pulled apart. And so we have lots of new generation of plate material. Okay, so there's lots of rock when you visit, lots of volcanoes going on right at the boundary. Well, how deep is that rock, right? So that's another. So it could be it could be relatively uh, broad in the sense, but it could be relatively shallow too, right? But actually, this is the Siberian traps. This is all lava. <laughs> okay, that's a lot of lava. <laughs> These are producing massive quantities of lava. Not lava like oh well, that's a lot, but lava like this is literally an ocean of lava okay so there's a lot of material deposited right and a lot of this has been eroded as well here's another example of it this is all the base of a volcano right this is all volcanic rock and you can see that look how steep these are um, uh, from that and the the other problem for us is remember if we go back to that carbon cycle which is going to change drastically the Siberian traps are primarily being fueled by oceanic rock, which is subducting and being burned away in the, in the, below the continental crust and then rising to the surface. And it turns out the oceanic rock has a lot more carbon gas in it than continental rock. And so not only are we going to get hit in a lot of different ways, we're also going to produce fantastic quantities of carbon through these volcanoes in ways that we don't normally get. Normally, we're not doing that as much. Now it's going to be all of the rock that we're going to generate is going to be high in carbon. So to give you some example, uh, what we're talking about here, volcanoes produce huge amounts of sulfates. Sulfates remain suspended in the air, and they also reflect light. So they, they will actually cool things. So in 1850, uh, Tambora, Mount Tambora exploded, and there's this scale, the VEI scale, uh, which rates how strong volcanoes are. Eight is the highest that we measure it at. It's like the Richter scale, it's logarithmic. How high do you think the PT extinction would rate on this scale if we were to measure it? It's past eight. <laughs> it, it is above the scale that we currently use, yes. It actually would measure a 10. So it is, not, it is not a little bit bigger. It's 1,000 times bigger than Mount Tambor, right? It would be 1,000 Mount Tambors occurring. So that is a lot of volcanic rock. Um, OK, so how strong was Mount Tambor? Because it's a 7, right? OK, well, there's no summer during that year in the Northern Hemisphere. That's pretty severe. That's one volcano. Um, in the Northeast, we actually had frost in July and August. Uh, Virginia had frost in August. So Virginia, which is much further south than here, right, doesn't actually have a summer. So that is a pretty cold year by many standards. 
We basically don't have uh, any food production um, north of Virginia during the summertime because there's no growing season. It never gets warm enough to do that. And the, the, of course, that results in huge amounts of famine and food prices, uh, it, especially for places like Europe, right, that suffer very bad in that case. At least in the U.S., we have areas that are further south than that. But if you're in places like Europe, you're in a lot of trouble. And these are good examples here. So you can see here that the difference in temperature, relatively speaking, those are differences of one to three centigrade. One to three centigrade on average. That's the difference in these. That's from one volcano. I'm telling you that there were literally thousands of volcanoes of this magnitude going off simultaneously. So you can imagine that things aren't going to get a little bit different. They're going to get a lot different. And they're going to get really, really bad. So the first thing, of course, that uh, volcanoes do is they release lots of of uh, sulfates. They also release carbon dioxide, but the sulfates are important first because they tend to prevent uh, sunlight from reaching the, the surface of the earth, and therefore they tend to cool things. So uh, volcanoes initially have a very strong cooling effect. They produce a lot of aerosols, and they make things feel much cooler than they are. What happens after the aerosols rain out, though, is that they produce enormous amounts of global of, of greenhouse gases, and those those push it in the other direction. So we go from a global cooling to a global warming. How long did it take the um, actual lava to solidify because of the cooling? Since it was so such a like giant explosion, and there was so many like so much sulfate in the atmosphere, how much? How long did it take for that? All those. When we deal with, when you're dealing with really hot rock, right, when you, that, the difference in temperature on the surface of the earth of even a few centigrade won't make a lot of difference about where, how long it takes to physically cool. However, the amount of lava will, and so there's going to be a lot of lava flow, right? So we have lots of surface of the earth that's very, very hot. Hot lava on hot lava stays very, very hot, and so it's going to flow for long distances. And of course, if you're anywhere near that, you're not going to, you can't grow underneath a lava. So... Um, that's gonna, that is going to be an issue if you're close to it. Further away, it won't be in that way. So what we're going to initially do is on the surface of the Earth, we are going to get very, very cold, very rapidly. And we're going we're gonna to see that. But what that's going to do is that's going to mean that our temperature is going to change drastically. We're going to tend to select for organisms that are cold tolerant. And then as soon as those aerosols start to slow down uh, relative to the amount that the, the uh, greenhouse gases are picking up heat, then we're going to switch back to a hot environment, and we're going to select for organisms that are heat tolerant, right? So first we're going to wipe those out, and we're not going to have any of them. Then we're going to select for them, and we're not going to have anything to draw from, because all of our organisms are adapted for cold environments, and that's the earth we're going to persist under, right? And so this, this volcano is going to produce lots of stuff like CO2. It's also going to, just to, just to mess with you, so one of the ozone, obviously, is very important. Um, volcanoes produce enormous amounts of chlorine, which react with the ozone and, and destroy the ozone layer. And this is one of the arguments that uh, industry used for a long time about why we shouldn't regulate aerosols because it was primarily volcanoes that were driving ozone depletion, which turned out to be completely false. But if you have literally thousands of volcanoes going off, then they do contribute significantly to the model. So we're going to strip away all of the ozone layer. So the Earth is going to be bathed in UV radiation. Um, we're going to have <laughs> we're going to have on top of that all sorts of awful, really bad acids. Hydrofluoric acid, which melts bone. Um, hydrochloric acid, which is a uh, really strong acid. And, and sulfuric acid, sulf uh, sulfurous gas is going to make sulfuric acid, which is going to strip away surface. So that's going to increase erosion rates. It's going to help uh, remove uh, metals that you might want. So it's going to leach metals out of the environment very, very rapidly. So if there's any metals that are normally dr coming out of the rocks, you're going to increase that very rapidly and expose all of them at once. You're also going to get environments where acid... If acid rain was bad in the Northeast, right, this is like acid rain on steroids. It's going to be really bad. Uh, that means that your uh, aquatic environments are going to switch from uh, maybe being varied between basic and acidic to primarily just being acidic. There's just going to be no way for them to maintain uh, that level of uh, uh, basic component within them. So this, this leads to a real conundrum, including for plankton down here. Um, high latitudes are going to be really well suited to the initial cold climates, but that means that once we switch away from that, we're actually going to reverse that and predominantly be under a warm weather environment situation, which means that we're not going to have, those animals are going to be gone. Um, they're going to be marginalized first. And as far as plankton are concerned, this is really bad for plankton. Um, it's it's going to cause all sorts of issues for plankton, not least of which is a lot of plankton are dependent on formation of calcium carbonate shells, which they will not be able to make, so they will die. Uh, and then um, on top of that, uh, 
uh, we're going to have issues with the seasonality of the ocean, and we're going to have problems with the ocean actually circulating, and which will, it will probably stop circulating, which is sort of a big deal if you're an animal that lives in the ocean. And uh, to give you some idea, when we talk about ocean acidification today, we're talking about changes in pH units of about 0.1 to 0.2. Ocean acidification at this point may have moved the scale as much as one pH unit. So these are enormous, fantastic changes. Anything that we talk about today where it's like, it's going to be bad, that is the tip of the iceberg if you were the Permian. It was going to be, if it would have only been that bad, it would have been a great day for that Permian-Triassic boundary. Okay, so if we look at the fossil record, we basically don't have anything in the center of the Earth. <laughs> We've obliterated everything. It's all gone. Uh, if, you're, if you're alive here, that's really good work. Um, but a lot of the stuff is now contained um, up to these edges of these environments. And it, it should also, this picture here of this, quote, tetrapod, there's a reason for that. As far as we can tell, there's basically one large species of, of tetrapod that survives this mass extinction event, which turns out to be a synapsid. Uh, but that's the only one. Uh, other than that, there's just a few species of smaller organisms that make it through, uh, literally a handful, uh, and for large bodies, it's, it's animals like that, and they're probably not regulated by predators, they probably just go through starvation extinction cycles, so probably populations overeat whatever remaining plants are there, and then they'll die, and then are repopulated from outside of that, because there just aren't large predators to eat them anymore, uh, or it may be something with parasites. Okay, so... We have a lot of CO2 coming into the environment. We actually still don't have enough carbon yet to explain that signature. So, does it, anybody know what this is? This is going to be really important for our global climate change scenario as well. The burning snow, yeah, actually the common name for it is fire ice. Um, it's methane clathrate, which is a methane, um, methane contained within ice. And there is more of this stuff saved in the bottom of the earth than w we would need to heat the earth many times over. Right? We, could, we could do the Permian extinction event again if we, if we liberated all, the, all of uh, the methane clathrate that remains within the bottom of the ocean. So uh, much of this is actually locked away in this, in this environment where there's ice formed around this methane and therefore it, is in, uh, it, it's not, it doesn't react with the atmosphere. And methane being a very, very strong greenhouse gas um, therefore does not contribute uh, nearly as much as it could uh, if a lot of it was exposed. That's fine. Uh, as long as one, your ocean waters are relatively cold uh, and two, your surface your surface temperatures are relatively cool. Okay, so we're not going to have that. <laughs> so we're going to liberate all of this methane, which is going to be enormous amounts of methane. Methane, of course, is much, much more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2. So we're going to exasperate the greenhouse gas effect. As we get warmer, we're going to drive into a warmer Earth. So this is sort of the same cycle we're running into today, where we get into what's called uh, a positive feedback loop where a feedback cycle generates more of the feedback, which generates more of the feedback cycle, which continues the loop again. Most things that we'd like to deal with are actually negative feedback. So if you generate lots of one thing, it slows down the generation of the next thing. So it's harder and harder to turn the wheel. That's what we'd like it to be. In this case, and in the case that we're dealing with today, as you turn the global climate change wheel, it gets faster and faster so that you speed it up. And this is a very good example of why that's going to happen. And this is actually a very real problem for us right now because this permafrost line, as that descends, more of this methane gets released. And that's what we're dealing with today. We're sinking the permafrost line very, very quickly. And as we do that, we're releasing way more methane. And that is going to be a, a huge, huge driver of uh, climate change in the future. And it may not, basically we may get to a point where it may not matter if we took all the cars off the road, we'll have more methane coming out than all of the rest of humanity combined. So this is a serious concern for people that deal with global climate change stuff. And to give you some idea about how much CO2 we drove into, the, or was driven into the atmosphere. So at the beginning of the Permian period, CO2 levels, again, the earth is warming at this point, CO2 levels are probably about three to four times uh, as high as they are today, and CO2 is directly related to methane. Um, in the, during the Permian extinction event, if, depending on what model you look at, you're probably at the order of about 30 times. So you go from CO2 being a marginal player in the atmosphere to being actually when we list out play, like major players in the atmosphere, like CO2 is in there. It's so large a component. That brings it from uh, what we normally measure things for CO2 is parts per million. By the time you get up to 30 times, you're in parts per thousand. So it's like a pretty large component of the atmosphere at that, at that period. 
Okay, so let's talk about uh, fungal spores. So it, it turns out, uh, I, I, I think I forgot to mention this, there's also an enormous, enormous, enormous fungal spike right at the Permian-Triassic boundary. And that, uh, that is, <laughs> that suggests what? What does that suggest for us? It's a lot of stuff dying, and primarily it's, it's, it's plant material because that's what dominates the biosphere. Um, that that when before the Permian-Triassic event, we think that fungal spores take up about 10% of the uh, uh, what we call sort of the pollen fallout, which includes fungal spores and pollen. Uh, at the event, it approaches 100% or, or at 100%. So there's basically nothing else. Okay? There's just dead plants everywhere. And, what, and when, as soon as they die, they're covered with fungus. And the reason for that, right, why would you have lots of fungus? Well, you don't have termites. <laughs> so you don't, have, you don't have these animals that are living in there and chewing through wood. So we don't have termites, so we've got fungus instead. So if you look at the species losses, right, so this is all, this is global climate change. It's sort of the worst it can be. Uh, it depends on who you talk to, but for aquatic environments, it's, it's probably somewhere in the 90s. Probably, I think the average hovers between 90 and 95 percent. If you talk to other people, they'll say it's as high as 99 percent of species will go extinct. The terrestrial animals, relatively speaking, we get by more, more easily with 70 percent losses, but there are far fewer species of terrestrial organisms. So if you got to 99 percent, you'd have like a rat thing and a lizard thing. I mean, it would just, there would just be nothing left on the surface of the earth and a bunch of beetles, basically, as well. We're going to get rid of 60% of all families on the surface of the earth are going to disappear at this event. So it's going to be most of these animals and 80% of genera, as far as we can tell. So that is an enormous quantity of our diversity. And the other thing that's important here is the, the Cretaceous tertiary event is probably a single day, and it's probably really bad and it probably extends for a few thousand years, maybe a million years. This event is going to occur multiple times, and it looks like uh, that the global climate change happened in waves as the, as the volcanoes, the strength of eruptions would wax and wane. So when there was a lot of volcanic eruptions, things would get really, 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 really bad, and most everybody would die. And then when that would tend to wane, animals would tend to return to environments, and their numbers would start to grow, and we have a little bit of diversification, and then there would be lots of volcanic eruptions, and any of that would die. So it looks like we have attempts at recovery that get aborted multiple times, and the animal life keeps getting wiped out, and so it goes, it, it just keeps wiping the slate off, and so fewer and fewer and fewer remnants are left on that surface. So one thing we can look for today, of course, is, oh, let's find, let's find a group of animals that show a clear PT um, extinction uh, signal. And the way we should do that is it should be that they should be ex excluded from the tropic zone. We should find them in the northern and the southern hemisphere in temperate regions, and we shouldn't be able to find them uh, in these tropic zones where it would be uh, completely impossible to live. And on top of that, the divergence time for those lineages should estimate at about 250 million years, right? We should split right at that point. I'm biased towards this group because I study them, but lampreys certainly made it through the PT event. They, again, they, they're probably around for about 500 million years. So they definitely were here 250 million years ago. And lo and behold, not only do they have that event um, in that they are distributed exactly as we would expect them to be, but their divergence time for these groups is exactly at 250 million years ago. So these are PT survivors, and the reason they don't exist in here, right, is because they got wiped out. Any groups that lived in that zone were completely wiped out, and what we're left is, is with these sort of generalist temperate species that are able to make it through. Okay, so this is actually a relatively funny comic, and I like it. Um, what's going to happen here is, is our friends, these little rat guys with the helmets on, they're going to disappear, and they're mo again, these are mostly therapsids, right? So we're not going to we're not going to make too many of those make it through. And what what is going to make it through in better order, not in great order, but in better order, are going to be the little guys, and those are going to be primarily things like archosaurs, and those are going to do terribly at the event, but less terribly. And then everybody else on the floor is just they got obliterated. As far as amphibians are concerned, for instance, we have one group of amphibians that made it through the Permian-Triassic extinction event, right? And they're the group that gave rise to all the groups that we have today. So you go from a relatively diverse amphibian lineage to one group and then all of our very derived groups that are, the, that are everybody else on the terrestrial surface. So if you had appeared back on the surface of the Earth uh, well after that event, you would have seen something like this where relatively boring plants, it would have been really easy to work with plants because you would have had like 
hundred species worldwide and you could have carried your little card anywhere you went and you could have found the same plant so that would have been really easy and this this guy right here which is a snapsid this is it <laughs> for large herbivorous animals and that is what remains on the surface of the earth and then there would have been little tiny uh, lizard like things running around that are probably that are going to be related to archosaurs which are going to fill the small carnivorous niches and outside of that um, you're going to have things like uh, insects and that, that's going to be predominantly uh, what the surface of the earth looks like. Here's a good reconstruction of that, right? There may be little hairs on it. It's fairly ugly. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to split right here. So the synapsids, even though they do make it through the extinction event, this huge global climate change extinction event that occurred for probably, uh, probably less than a million years, they're not going to make it through, and they're not going to do particularly well. They are going to... Uh, they're going to make it through just with a few members. Those members are going to be in the early Triassic Earth, but they are not going to manage to, to radiate quickly enough to take up niche space. And what is going to radiate quickly are our diapsids. They are going to radiate, and you're going to have a lot of diapsid growth. And so the beginning of the Triassic is really the beginning of diapsid radiation. And within the diapsids, of course, is the group we're most concerned with and which we're going to talk about how they radiated next lecture, the dinosaurs. And so we're going to leave the earth of synapsids, we're going to leave the earth of these weird mammal-like things, and we're going to enter an earth that's relatively depauperate of organisms and is going to be dominated by um, uh, initially small diapsids, and then they're going to get larger and larger and fill out this niche. So by the, as we enter into the Triassic wholesale, so we're, we're passing through that huge climate change event, uh, we're going to get into, uh, these are now diapsids, and they are now filling the role of uh, multiple uh, uh, top predators. Um, they're going to have multiple trophic levels, and they're going to do uh, decently well in those locations, right? And they look a lot like crocodiles and alligators, and that should come as no surprise. We're down near the base of the tree, and so a lot of the characteristics that you see in crocodiles and alligators are uh, primitive characteristics that were brought with the Archosaurian lineage, and these guys, being primitive members of that group, will have those. Now, these guys are trying to do things a little bit like dinosaurs in some ways, not least of which is uh, that they are becoming bipedal. The predators are. Uh, they're starting to tuck the arms in underneath the body if they need to. The heads are becoming larger, and they're re reducing uh, weight in the bones, right? So we're becoming more, uh, more of a running lineage. And uh, some of these other characteristics that you see in crocodiles and alligators are going to go by the wayside. Big, heavily armored animals pretty much are going to be gone. That's going to disappear. We're going to have very few lineages of dinosaurs that attempt to do this. They are going to be successful in the sense that they'll be long-lived, but they'll always be a marginal component of their communities. They'll never be dominant. And you can also see that the max size now... So we moved from a max size where everything was either the size of a lizard or the size of a pig, um, and now we're starting to move back up as we move away from this, this extinction event. So we wiped out everybody else, and now we're starting to get larger and larger animals, which you can see are starting to, to approach those sizes that we had before and even surpass them to some degree if, if, with the tail length in there. So this is a good example of sort of a post-cataclysm fauna. And, uh, what you can see here is, again, that a lot of these, and I've already got dinosaurs in here, right? We're really starting to get dinosaurs. But what you can see is that a lot of these organisms look similar again. Again, they look, uh, in many cases, like some sort of very derived crocodile-like thing, uh, which is not wrong. Uh, they are related, again, and they, they pick up a lot of new characteristics. And there, there are uh, a variety of sizes, so there's multiple trophic levels, um, and there's lots of diversity within it. Here's our friend down here, right? And you can see that by the time we get a little bit further into the geological record, the synapsids largely drop out. None of the members of these communities uh, remain anymore as, as significant components of their uh, community, other than that they retain small-bodied niches, which synapsids seem to do very, very well, and they will now do this until uh, the end of the Cretaceous. So synapsids, as far as we're concerned, at this point, after we pass the Permian-Triassic extinction event, give up large body size because they are no longer able to, to use that niche space. They are just completely uh, uh, outcompeted in the sense that they aren't there anymore, and then the, the animals related to dinosaurs radiate to fill out that niche space and they won't have a chance to radiate and fill that niche space again until the end of the Cretaceous period. Okay, so I have uh, on here, I also have a couple of videos, and I think I posted the actual PowerPoint, so these, these links should be live, so you should feel free um, to click those videos as well. These lectures will deal very clearly with it. 
for instance, uh, one thing I didn't mention here is that the Permian Triassic extinction event, one of the very important things that occurs when you burn um, lots of plant material is what, what gets released in the atmosphere that we're concerned about in eating too much of. Why do we have advisories for shellfish and fish? It's mercury. So what happens when you burn a lot of plant material? You release a lot of mercury. So they're gonna, we're going to burn a lot of plant material. <laughs> what's, it, what's another thing that, that becomes a real issue? Um, well, if we're releasing lots and lots and lots and lots of mercury, right, that's really bad for uh, organisms. So uh, the other thing that's occurring, and this, there's actually so much mercury released at this point in time uh, that it actually it may in fact contribute to the extinction event. Animals, large trophic organisms may simply have died um, from things like mercury exposure because there's so much organic matter being burned away um, into the atmosphere and then raining back out again. So there's a, so just to give you some complexity about this, the simple solution to this whole thing is there's a large global climate change that drives this, right? We have really highly fluctuating temperatures that's driven by CO2 primarily from volcanoes, but it also comes from things like methane sources, right, that drive this, this capture of energy. On top of that, we have a lot of other mechanisms that are occurring at the same time. We have uh, the loss of things like uh, refugia, um, in those environments, and we have uh, the, d the deposition of things like lots of mercury, the loss of, of surface cover, so we lose soils and sediments, so we lose all those organisms. So this extinction event is not driven by a single gun per se, other than that global climate change pushes it in one direction, and a lot of that is driven by things like the Siberian traps, but the, ca the ultimate causes of it start to pile up very, very quickly, and there's basically a laundry list of things that go wrong right at this extinction event. Everything that you can think of that you don't want to occur in a tiny little orb, that's what we're going to start to do to it. Right? We're going to make it really bad really fast. And so the Permian Triassic extinction event becomes so extreme because all of the worst stuff that we can think of, the laundry list of horrible things that we can do to the biosphere, we do them, and we, it's sort of a, a, an experiment to see if we can wipe out vertebrate life, and we get very close. This is as close as the Earth has ever come to losing all vertebrate life on it, and certainly as close as we've ever come to uh, flipping back to a Precambrian period, where we'll just have an ocean dominated by bacteria. And by and large, if you were at the ocean uh, in, the, in, in the extinction event, you would have recognized it as the Cambrian Ocean, or the Precambrian Ocean. It would have been mostly run by bacteria, and there would have been very, very limited amounts of oxygen in it, so you would have seen basically anoxic bacteria communities everywhere, which would have been a very Precambrian environment. And so we, apparently you can recreate those now, so those communities appear to have survived to some degree, but thankfully we make it through this event. And as with the, the biosphere, it seems very resilient, and even when you hammer on it really hard, it still recovers um, to some degree. Now, we don't recover to the diversity levels that we have now until 100 million years later. So we will not see the diversity we have at the end of the Permian for another 100 million years. We have a long way to go to get all that diversity back. But we do see terrestrial environments and also oceanic environments starting to reform these higher trophic levels and to produce more and more complex environments again relatively quickly within a few million years, right? Six million years is a long time, but after six million years, we do see things like forests starting to come back. Now, they're limited in diversity and limited in cover, but they are there. And so the, the important thing to note here is if you can make it through an extinction event, if you can squeak by, you don't have to last that long, right? In the, in the course of the, of the picture of the Earth, you don't need to go that far usually to make it back out onto the other side. But it is such a strong driver that it will wipe out most things and you won't have very much make it through. And it's to the survivors go the spoils and that's what's going to happen to the archosaurs. It's not that they were better at it. It's just that they got lucky. They were there at the right time. Apparently they had the right um, situation to evolve into these, these more diverse, diverse organisms. And so they dominate the land very quickly before other lineages take over again. And so that's the world of the Triassic, and that is the world that dinosaurs appear into, which means that dinosaurs are absolutely not the dominant form of life in the Triassic. They play a far more marginal role, and it's not until we get to the Jurassic that the dinosaurs actually radiate out and basically fill all the large body niche space that's available. All right, any questions?